They're highly secretive. They have knowledge they keep to themselves. They operate clandestinely. And they practice ancient mysterious rituals. They are secret societies. Are secret societies a hotbed of evil? They are certainly the subject of countless conspiracy theories. They are accused of pursuing a sinister objective, of seeking to rule the world. Perhaps, as many claim, they rule it already. Time and again, people sense perfidious conspiracies everywhere. But which of their suspicions are well-founded and which are based on mere fiction, created by successful authors like Dan Brown? Secret fraternities have existed for thousands of years. Their members are in our midst, everywhere. Join us as we delve into the dark parallel world of secret societies. Fussel from Göttingen is on the trail of perhaps the most fantastic conspiracy in Christianity, the possibility that Jesus had descendants. If that is true, are they being protected by a secret order? Ulrich Walter from Munich is investigating the suspicion that staff at NASA conspired to fake the lunar landing. For 2,000 years, the Vatican has been a center of spiritual power and of secular dominion. The focus here is on the salvation of the human soul, but also on influence and power. The Vatican is the subject of much speculation. A sensational secret is believed to be kept within its walls, a secret that, were it to be revealed, would rock the world. It involves Jesus Christ. Located in the catacombs in Rome are the oldest depictions of Jesus. They show a young man full of joys of life, a man who is said to have had a wife, Mary Magdalene. Verse 55 of the apocryphal Gossip of Philip states, the companion of the Savior was Mary Magdalene. According to the manuscript, he loved her more than all the other disciples and would often kiss her on the mouth. If that were true, Christian history and theology would have to be rewritten. So is the Vatican suppressing a truth that would undermine its power? The Da Vinci Code, the bestseller by Dan Brown, made the story of Jesus and Mary accessible to a broader public, and the film with Tom Hanks and Audrey Tautou certainly did. But how could Christ have a bloodline unless... Mary was pregnant at the time of the crucifixion. For her own safety and for that of Christ's unborn child, she fled the Holy Land and came to France. And here it is said she gave birth to a daughter, Sarah. The south of France. This, then, is where the descendants of Jesus are said to live, in our very midst, protected, according to Dan Brown's novel, by a secret fraternity. Marion Fussel is heading for the place where it all began, Ben Le Chateau. Mm -hmm. 
This sleepy hamlet has a strikingly pompous church. Many see this as an indication that Rennes-le-Château is the epicenter of a large-scale conspiracy. A remarkable church full of mysterious symbols. It seems totally out of place in such a small village. Terrifying creatures greet the visitor. Do the statues here portray the mother of God, or perhaps Mary Magdalene holding Christ's child? This small village, and especially its church, is steeped in legend. Its redevelopment and pompous refurbishment around 1900, along with the construction of other buildings nearby, have given rise to questions as to how it was all financed. The work must have consumed fairly large sums, and even today, the question of where the money came from is the subject of much speculation. The incongruities surrounding the church go back to the summer of 1885, when Father Berenger Saunier took up office in Rennes-le-Château. At the time, the parish really was as poor as the proverbial church mouse. Nevertheless, the priest soon embarked on the expensive conversion of his church. It wasn't long before his flock began to wonder where Abbe Saunier had managed to find so much money for his construction project. Marian Fussell sees the building project and the mysterious bloodline of Jesus Christ as elements of a major conspiracy theory. Christian Dumac has provided him with further details. He has examined the village priest's estate and knows all the legends associated with Rennes-le-Château. The sums spent by Abbé Saunier went far beyond his means. It was clearly not his income as a priest that enabled him to construct all the buildings. Back then, that raised one or two questions amongst the villagers. It gave rise to the rumor that he must have found some treasure. And for a long time, the nature of this treasure was the source of much speculation. Was it cash, valuable relics perhaps, or ancient documents proving, as many suspect, that Jesus had descendants? Saunier is said to have used the documents to blackmail the Catholic Church into giving him hush money, not to reveal the secret of Christ's daughter. The figure at the center of this major scandal was Mary Magdalene. Leonardo da Vinci is said to have immortalized Jesus' wife in his famous painting of the Last Supper. The claim is that it is not the beardless disciple John who is pictured to the left of Christ, but Mary Magdalene. The legend that Jesus had a family was embroidered more and more. His descendants were said to be protected by a secret fraternity. Best-selling author Dan Brown plays with this incredible version in his novel, The Da Vinci Code. Who are you? There have been many names. The Keepers, Guardians, the Priory of Sion, Although the Priory of Sion is said to be ancient, its existence was not documented until the 1970s, when French author Pierre Plantard wrote about it. Had he betrayed secret knowledge of the fraternity? The trail leads us to Paris, where the Priory of Sion is believed to have been active.
The most important documents on the Brotherhood of Scion are kept in the French National Library. A venerable institution, what is stored here appears to be incontestable. Religious scholar Frédéric Lenoir is fascinated by the Brotherhood and by the idea of Christ having descendants. He has made a detailed study of the files. In his research, Lenoir came across an important document, a list of the Grand Masters of the Priory of Sion, cataloged as such by the National Library. The neatly typed list goes back to the time of Jesus. It includes such famous names as that of universal genius, Leonardo da Vinci. Legendary scientist and mathematician Isaac Newton is also mentioned. One illustrious figure after another, but were they all really members of the inner circle? When you look at the list, you notice at once that all the historical facts seem to be right. The dates are correct, and so are the coats of arms. But you then realize that some of the figures on the list could never have had anything to do with the priory. Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, had no contact with the Knights Templar. Here, reality has been mixed with fiction. But the general public and the media jumped at the blend of fact and fiction. It was the grain of reality that made the fiction credible. But that's something the authors of such products of the imagination are also aware of. When they merge the two, it is hard to see the result of exactly what it is. What struck me was the creation of a modern legend in exactly the same way the ancient Greeks concocted their amazing myths, which still exist today. In the form of the Priory, a modern myth was created which has enjoyed global success, and that's quite extraordinary. Doubts over the Priory of Sion also arise from the fact that the list of Grand Masters cannot be authenticated. It was passed to the National Library anonymously and was only accepted into obligatory storage. A conclusive document exists in the form of the Priory's deed of foundation, signed by Pierre Plantin in 1956. So the Priory of Sion is a 1950s invention, as Planta himself admitted in the late 80s. The ancient brotherhood dedicated to protecting the bloodline of Christ never existed. Another theory also rests on an unsound footing. In Rennes le Chateau, Marion Fussel discovers why the priest had so much money at his disposal. Records he left show that it came from an illegal trade and intercessions for the deceased. Sonnier was a confidence trickster. The account books that have been preserved show quite clearly that there was no treasure involved, just a systematic trade in mass services, but that didn't affect the legend. People still suspected that hidden treasure was involved and went on searching for it. It's still astonishing, though, that Sonnier should have gotten away with the scam for so long. How gullible his villagers were. The legend continues to be spun out, however, for belief in such mysteries lies in the very nature of the human soul. Marion Fussel has analyzed what convinces people most of all. He has found that the more significant and the more fantastic a secret sounds, the more likely it is to be believed. Precisely what is involved is actually of secondary importance. Where the theory of the Priory of Sion is concerned, one individual, Plantard, wanted to get rich. 
That in itself is relatively harmless, but there are also other conspiracy theories which focus on entire groups, and those theories can become a real danger. That was also the case with the most sinister conspiracy theory in history, the myth of a Jewish world conspiracy. In the first half of the 20th century, the Jews were blamed for all ills. They were accused of wanting to bring countries to their knees, first of all with capitalist money, and then with the help of Bolshevism, their alleged goal, global dominance. Wealthy Jewish entrepreneurs served as proof of these crude assertions. Families like the Balins, the Rothschilds, the Guggenheims, and the Astors. The Jews were painted as the enemy. When es dem international Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. The story of a Jewish world conspiracy, an imaginary plot, begins in Prague, at a most unusual, indeed creepy location. Every 100 years, leading Jews were said to gather at Prague's Jewish cemetery as the Elders of Zion, a Jewish shadow government whose alleged aim was the suppression of the Gentiles. But the myth of this meeting, a product of the imagination, was to have dire consequences. In Berlin, the fear of a Jewish world conspiracy was used to stir up hatred of the Jews. Marian Fussel wants to find out how this production of the imagination came about and why so many people still believe in it even today. He has come to the Jewish Museum in Berlin to meet historian Wolfgang Benz, an expert on anti-Semitism. Benz has made a close study of the accusations leveled at Jews in the 20th century. The theory of a world conspiracy comes from a small book entitled The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Virtually no other inflammatory publication of the last century has wrought as much havoc as this pamphlet. With great skill, the author plays with fears, prejudices, and enemy stereotypes. The defamatory propaganda involved in creating enemy stereotypes draws people to support the existing center of power. It is a dark and gloomy narrative. Allegedly, every 100 years, the Jewish elders meet at the cemetery in Prague to report on their progress in permeating the world's structures. But the report is headed protocols to give the impression of it being an authentic, official document. The claim is that the protocols were recorded secretly at the first Zionist World Congress, which actually took place. But in reality, the focus was on something totally different. The World Congress was convened by Theodor Herzl, but he wasn't nurturing visions of global dominance. Herzl wanted to establish a Jewish state in Palestine. So why was the truth twisted? Minorities have always been exposed to prejudices and made into enemy stereotypes. The end result in this case was a compact, rounded picture. The Jews are evil. The Jews are a threat to non-Jews. The Jews want sovereignty of the world. St. Petersburg. The true story of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion begins during the time of the Russian Empire. Nowhere was hatred of the Jews more widespread than among the people ruled over by Tsar Nicholas II. More Jews lived in the Russian Empire than anywhere else. Regarded as the enemies of Orthodox Christians, they were persecuted. Сам понимаешь, 
The head of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, Pyotr Rashkovsky, used the anti-Semitic mood in the country for a political ploy. He wanted to pin the blame for oppositional attacks on the Tsar on the Jews. To achieve this, all he had to do was discredit them even further. Rachkovsky needed a document that would enable him to defame the Jews. Since he didn't have one, Rachkovsky had one prepared at short notice. Matvei Golovinsky was commissioned with the task, and disaster took its course. Can a specific group really be vilified so quickly in society? And why is this done? People need scapegoats, and those in power certainly do. They need scapegoats to conceal their own failures or weaknesses, or to mobilize people for some goal or other. Where conspiracy theories are concerned, of course, this is taken to extremes. And the worst extreme is the conspiracy theory based on the protocols of the elders of Zion. Jews as a whole are stigmatized and made responsible for all the world's ills. Intelligence officer Golovinsky was actually a specialist in producing bogus press articles. But now he wrote the basic inflammatory pamphlet for many years to come. He shamelessly plagiarized and mixed fiction with reality. Entire passages were lifted word for word from the satirical French novel, The Dialogue in Hell by Maurice Joly. Golovinsky finished by heading his text Protocols to indicate its authenticity, even though everything was an utter fabrication. In the Russian Empire, what was probably the most dangerous document to appear in the 20th century was reprinted time and again. Within a few years, the fabricated protocols began their triumphal global advance. The mendacious pamphlet had its finger on the anti-Semitic nerve of the time. In the end, Golovinsky's text was translated into around 60 languages. In Germany, too, it was regarded as authentic. The protocols of the elders of Zion dovetailed perfectly with the crude mindscape of the National Socialists. It was soon alleged that the text was a fabrication. But once a conspiracy has been exposed, it is hard to allay all suspicions. The National Socialists referred to this fictitious protocol as if it provided actual proof of a Jewish world conspiracy. Ultimately, all anti-Semitic propaganda, the whole persecution of the Jews, was based on this document. Under the National Socialist terror regime, the protocols led inevitably to the Holocaust. Six million Jews were systematically murdered before Nazi Germany capitulated. The protocols of the elders of Zion survived the shock of the Holocaust and the fall of the Third Reich. They continue to spread hatred of the Jews, even today. Marian Fussel rediscovered the inflammatory pamphlet on the homepage of Hamas, the radical Islamic movement. Its charter contains excerpts from the protocols as if they were an authentic document and not a fabrication. 
Conspiracy theories simplify complex issues in an extreme way. There are no shades of gray, just black and white, good and evil. One such conspiracy theory is the Jewish world conspiracy, which is still in the heads of millions of people worldwide. Time and again, it's used for achieving political ends and for interpreting current events. Mistrust of the government has always been deeply rooted in American society. One of the best-known conspiracy theories led to a bizarre experiment in the Nevada desert. On a summer's night in 1976, a man set out to expose what at the time was the pinnacle of American science as a cheap fabrication. Bill Casing did not believe that the Americans had landed on the moon. The whole mission, he said, was just technologically impossible. It was merely a political gambit in the Cold War. Casing suspected that the legendary moon landing was actually staged on the Earth, and he reckoned he could prove it. On that summer's night, Bill Casing took on the U.S. government. If Casing were right, the world would no longer be talking about one of the great adventures of all time, but about the greatest deception of all time. On July 16, 1969, a Saturn V rocket weighing 3,000 tons lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Its destination, the moon. The mission was a global spectacle. Worldwide, 500 million viewers excitedly watched its progress on television. In a bold speech given in September 1962, John F. Kennedy set the tone for the space race. The U.S. president was staking everything because he knew that the plan to put a man on the moon was highly ambitious. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Kennedy needed to be successful because in the space field, the Americans were lagging years behind their arch enemy, the Soviet Union. In 1957, the Soviets had launched the first animal into orbit, a dog called Laika. Four years later, Yura Gagarin went down in history as the first human being in space. Gagarin made a complete orbit of the planet. I see the Earth. It is so beautiful, he radioed back from his spacecraft. Space seemed to belong to the Russians. NASA, however, had to cope with one failure after another and the tragic loss of human life. The Apollo program was costing a fortune, but the success that was so ardently desired failed to materialize. In the psychology of the Cold War, this was a calamitous situation for the Americans. After all, two different political systems were vying for supremacy. The Sputnik success was a massive shock to the Americans who, up to then, had been world leaders, certainly leaders of the free world, a country that played a dominant role in technology and commerce, in all other areas, in fact, found that it was now lagging behind in the important field of space research. Consequently, America made every conceivable effort to recover from its shock. It was about winning the battle of the systems, a victory the Americans had to achieve at almost any price. In July 1969, the decisive Apollo 11 mission was launched. The goal? To establish U.S. supremacy in space. Twelve minutes after liftoff, the three astronauts on board entered the Earth's orbit, hurtling through space at a speed of nearly 40,000 kilometers an hour. The flight to the moon took three days. The astronauts orbited the Earth's satellite three times. Then, 
Buzz Aldrin commenced the landing maneuver onto the dry sea of tranquility. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, okay, engine stop. Drifting, uh, the Eagle has landed. We copy you down, Eagle. That's one small step for man. Mark, giant lead for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful for radio. Hey, you got it? That's a good step. Very pretty out here. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? A massive triumph. Or was it, in fact, nothing more than a giant con? Bill Kiesing was the first to voice the suspicion. In 1976, he accused the government of having filmed the moon landing on Earth. He was convinced that all the evidence for a landing, the photographs and footage, was manipulated. The flag, the footprints, nothing, he said, could have been photographed like that on the moon. And in the Nevada desert, he intended to prove how easy it is to deceive people. After all, the terrain in the desert is very similar to that on the moon. Bill Casing took his own moon photographs. And indeed, the material he produced bears a striking similarity to that presented by NASA. So what is real and what is fabrication? Was the triumphal return of the Apollo 11 heroes merely part of a gigantic deception? To pull it off, the US government and NASA would have had to act as a giant secret organization. And if it had, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin were wrongly celebrated as heroes. Marian Fussell has come to Munich to investigate the accusations leveled by critics of NASA and clear up matters 40 years after man allegedly first landed on the moon. In 1993, Ulrich Walter from Munich Technical University was himself an astronaut. He spent 10 days in space carrying out scientific experiments. Today, Walter is professor of space technology at the university. Month after month, Ulrich Walter receives hundreds of letters, all asking the same question. Did the Americans really land on the moon? Even today, countless people still believe that they were duped by the Apollo 11 mission, even though NASA's film and photographic material has been studied in great detail. The theory of a conspiracy involving a faked lunar landing already received support in the 1970s because of the Cold War climate and also because of the mistrust within America through Watergate and various other affairs. People could imagine the government, in this case NASA, doing absolutely everything to dupe the people. Puzzle number one. Why are there no stars visible on the photographs? Puzzle number two. Why is there no crater to be seen under the landing module's propulsion unit? Puzzle number three. Why are the astronauts seen exiting the capsule brightly lit while the rest of the landing module is in shadow? Puzzle number four. Why is the American flag fluttering even though there is no wind on the moon? Those questions had already irritated a skeptic Bill Casing. In 1976, he published his concerns in a book and earned a lot of money from it. What Casing began runs continuously through the story of this accusation of fraud. Conspiracy theorists have come up with new suspicions time and again. But at the center of every dispute are the photographs that were taken on the Apollo mission to the moon, or 
taken elsewhere. Ulrich Walter knows every detail of the photographs. He believes he can refute every single objection. The former astronaut is certain that every American moon landing was totally bona fide, even though many people might find the idea of human beings walking around on another celestial body simply inconceivable. There's a simple reason why the stars are not visible on certain photographs. With a really bright motif, you have to close the aperture. So, since the light from the stars is extremely weak, on some photographs, they are no longer visible. That's also why the astronaut in the shade appears brightly lit. The moon's surface reflects sunlight. And what about the missing crater? A crater can only be created if there is scree under the landing module. But the surface of the moon is relatively firm and covered with a layer of dust roughly two centimeters thick. So when the module landed, the gases blew away the dust. If the substrate hadn't been fairly firm, the astronauts couldn't have walked on it. That's why there's no crater visible. And why is the flag fluttering? One of the astronauts took the flag and stuck it in the ground. To drive it in firmly, he moved it to and fro. The shaking made the flag wave, and this was interpreted as fluttering in the wind. Marian Fussel does not doubt that the American moon landing was genuine. It's something else that troubles him the fact that this conspiracy theory simply won't go away, despite all the arguments against it. Many people still find the moon landing incomprehensible, along with many other things, too. Conspiracy theories will probably be around for as long as mankind is. That's because they have more to do with what people believe than with what they know. They can't be refuted with counter-evidence or counter-arguments because anyone prepared to believe a conspiracy theory will not be put off, let alone convinced by them. That's probably the true power of a conspiracy, the fact that it simply cannot be eradicated. In an age in which people find it hard to orient themselves, fantasies involving an explanation of the world are gratefully seized upon. Some people believe they are merely the playthings of dark forces, lied to by those whose structures they cannot peer into, the church, governments, and secret societies. No conspiracy theory is so far-fetched that it cannot be spread worldwide. In fact, the more far-fetched it is, the more likely people are to find it credible. <laughs>